Welcome back to another Space News Summary with me. In this week's seven-day recap, we'll be taking a look at some very interesting developments with SpaceX's Starship and with its Raptor engines, as well as reflect on some launches from last week and on some international drama being stirred up from Russia. There's also some great upcoming launches to discuss, like NASA's Asteroid Redirect mission in a couple of days. All this and more in today's video. Let's kick off with the first segment, which, as usual, is your weekly dose of Starship updates. Not a huge amount of big news has rolled in over the last week regarding Starship, it's just business as usual down at Boca Chica, with crew members working tirelessly on the Starship orbital launch pad and tower, as well as on the new wider high bay, and of course on upcoming Starship vehicles. The biggest development I believe was the stacking of Booster 5. You can just about see it through the high bay's opening in this great photo from Carlos. Moving over to Booster 4, we had this great image shared by Elon on Twitter showing the Raptors all mounted to the rocket's base. What's interesting though is that he later went on to talk about how SpaceX's upcoming Raptor 2 engine will have significant improvements over the Raptor 1, the engine that we've seen SpaceX use up to now, with this bare Raptor 1 in Everyday Astronauts interview supposedly bearing close resemblance to Raptor 2. But in this Twitter thread, Elon stated that a complete engine overhaul will be necessary for the engine that will actually make life multi planetary, i.e. the engine that will be used on the final Starship design that SpaceX will use to construct their visionary Mars city. In fact, the engine will be so dramatically different from Raptor that it wouldn't even be called Raptor. Raptor, in its current state, is one of, if not the, most advanced rocket engines ever built, so it's very interesting that Elon feels that it won't cut it for what he wants Starship to eventually do. A few people, myself included, wondered if perhaps this is more due to the production of the engine rather than there being a problem with the engine itself. Itself. To complete a thousand starships to build the Mars city, tens of thousands of Raptor engines would need to be mass produced, so perhaps a slightly technically inferior but substantially easier to construct and maintain engine would be better. Or perhaps it's something else. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And hey, while you're down there, I always do appreciate a like on the video, help support the channel against the algorithm and all that good stuff. Anyway, another big update regarding Starship came from the FAA, who have finally shared an update with us on their environment review process for Starship launches at Boca Chica. They now believe that the review will be complete by the 31st of December, which is excellent news. Assuming that this goes through successfully without any further delay, SpaceX will be able to apply for the launch license of Flight 420 and see Starship make its first orbital flight attempt as early as January 2022, which according to Elon during an online presentation at the SSB and BPA joint fall meeting last week, confirmed was the date that SpaceX were aiming for. We learned a few Few other things during his presentation as well. First of all, SpaceX hoped to have the launch pad and the launch tower completed in late November and will then do, in Elon's words, a bunch of tests. Presumably these all being related to the test campaign of Booster 4. And then go for launch in January. He did clarify that there is a lot of risk associated with the first launch and said that it wasn't very likely to be fully successful, but regardless of the outcome it'll certainly represent big progress for SpaceX and the space industry as a whole when you think about it. Following Following this first launch, SpaceX are aiming for a high launch rate for 2022. In Elon's words, they want a dozen launches or maybe more in 2022 alone, which will be absolutely crazy. I know a lot of us look back on the SN8 to SN15 era with a bit of nostalgia now, given how crazy it was to see so many flights, but when you think about it, this was only really five launches, and nobody could even see one of them with the SN11 flight taking place in dense fog. Now we'll see more than double that in 2022 if SpaceX get their way, so I am definitely looking forward to seeing what the new year brings. Other bits of information shared by Elon during his talk included his estimation that Starship will begin carrying commercial, valuable payloads by 2023, and by this time it'll be significantly cheaper than Falcon 9. Currently, the engine build rate is the biggest constraint on how many vehicles SpaceX can make. Whether or not Raptor 2, or whatever the not Raptor engine SpaceX go with, will alleviate this remains to be seen. Kind of makes me lean more toward my thought that perhaps a slightly inferior but ultimately much easier to produce engine will be what overthrows Raptor, but we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Anyway, that's pretty much all I wanted to say on Starship this week, but folks, there were loads of other exciting things going on last week. From Russian satellite explosions, New Glenn news, and successful flights from Rocket Lab, China, Ariane Space and Astra, so let's dive into all of that now. 
perhaps the biggest news of the week was a missile test conducted by Russia, in which they destroyed one of their own satellites. This caused international outrage as the destruction of the satellite created a large field of debris which could have threatened the International Space Station, so much so that the crew of the station were evacuated into their Dragon and Soyuz vehicles so that they could quickly depart from the station in case of disaster. Luckily, this wasn't required, but still, what on earth were Russia thinking? The explosion generated about 1,500 large orbiting pieces of debris, and also hundreds of thousands of smaller fragments, which can likely be tracked, but we won't know because the US military wouldn't want to disclose any information about their sensor capabilities. A far more sensible thing for Russia to have done would have been to destroy a satellite in a lower orbit, like how the United States and Indian Space Agency tested their own anti-satellite capabilities by destroying a satellite in a very low orbit, meaning that any debris would quickly burn up in the atmosphere rather than stay in orbit and threaten any space assets. Regardless though, I don't think I can really condone any space activity that results in large amounts of debris being thrown out everywhere, and hopefully international action is taken to prevent countries from performing such tests in the future. Now, we did have some slightly more peaceful rocket launches over the last week as well. The first orbital launch was on the 16th of November and was an Ariane Space Vega rocket launching from the French Guiana spaceport in South America. The rocket carried three Ceres satellites which will fly in formation and form a space-based electronic signals intelligence program operated by France's military. The launch went well and the satellites are now operational in low Earth orbit. The next launch came from New Zealand's Mahia Peninsula on the 18th of November and was Rocket Lab's latest electron mission, Love at First Insight. This was the second of four dedicated launches for Black Sky, a geospatial intelligence service from American aerospace company Spaceflight Industries Incorporated. On board was Black Sky 10 and 11, which are both Earth observation satellites and both were successfully deployed to low Earth orbit. What was cool about this mission was that Rocket Lab recovered the first stage via a controlled ocean splashdown under parachute. A helicopter was used to track and observe the descending stage in preparation for future aerial capture attempts, as Rocket Lab eventually planned to have the descending booster plucked straight from the air before landing. The helicopter successfully tracked the returning booster and completed communications tests in the recovery zone, bringing Rocket Lab one step closer to catching a rocket from the sky, bringing it back to the production complex for refurbishment, and then launching it into space again. The next launch we saw came from China on the 20th of November and was a Long March 4B carrying a single GFN Earth observation satellite to low Earth orbit. The launch went well and the satellite is now deployed and active. The final launch we saw was also on the 20th of November and was Astro fourth orbital launch attempt of their prototype Rocket 3 launch vehicle. And I'm pleased to say they finally did it. This is Astra's first undisputed success and this flight makes them the eighth private company to launch a rocket capable of achieving low Earth orbit and only the fourth company to launch a privately developed fully liquid fueled launch vehicle into orbit. Now we won't have to wait very long at all for their next flight, they're aiming for a launch date of the 1st of December, where Rocket 3 will launch 5 CubeSats for NASA's Elana 41 mission. Here's hoping this flight goes as well as last week's did. Over in Florida, Blue Origin rolled out their new Glenn Pathfinder vehicle for several mission operations tests, including route verifications, recovery and refurbishment simulations, stage mate simulations, and vehicle rollout at the pad. This is not flight hardware, but is nonetheless an important set of tests for Blue Origin to perform ahead of rolling out any actual flight hardware, so good to see that progress is starting to be made down at Blue Origin's rocket building division, rather than just with their legal team. Anyway, that's a wrap on what I think were the biggest stories of last week, but guys, there are some very exciting ones to get ready for this week, so let's talk about that now. The first launch of the week will be NASA's DART mission. This will launch on the 24th of November on board a Falcon 9 and is definitely one of the most exciting launches for 2021, I think. DART is an acronym that stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test and, as the name would suggest, this mission will aim to test a method of planetary defense against near-Earth objects. The mission will deliberately crash a space probe into the double asteroid Didymos to see if the kinetic effect of a spacecraft collision could successfully divert an asteroid that's on a collision course with Earth. The collision itself will take place almost a year after the launch on the 2nd of October 2022 and we'll get some cool third person views of the impact as the DART mission will feature a small CubeSat built by the Italian space agency which will separate from the main spacecraft 10 days before impact to acquire images of the collision and generated ejector. The next launch of the week will also be on the 24th of November and will be a Soyuz 2.1B operated by Roscosmos. 
is launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome with a Progress MUM space tug on board, on top of which will be the brand new International Space Station module Pritchal, which is a nodal module with a pressurised spherical ball-shaped design with six docking ports. Hopefully the docking with the station goes a little bit smoother than the last Russian module to join, the Nyorka module, which of course sent the station into a bit of a spin. After the Pritchal launch, the very next day, Russia will launch another Soyuz 2.1B. This time it'll be from the Blasetska launch site and on board will be a single EKS-5 satellite, which is an early warning satellite designed to detect incoming ballistic missiles. The satellite will be placed into a Tundra orbit, which is a highly elliptical geosynchronous orbit with a high inclination. That Soyuz flight is the final expected launch of the week, which therefore I guess brings an end to this week's episode of Space This Week. What was the highlight of the week for you? For me, I reckon it was finally being able to see Astra achieve orbit. But what about you? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, it's around this time in the video that I give a huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling on the left there. And I should also thank every single member of the Lounge Squad, aka the members of this channel, who get exclusive emojis to use in the comments, as well as a badge of honor next to their name. If you want to join either my Patreon or the channel, there are links below. On screen, there should now be a couple of video suggestions from my channel. And of course, stay subscribed for more space this week and hopefully more Kerbal. I've been toying with an idea for a video so hopefully I get a chance to start filming it soon. Anyway thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you next time.